wow, what a beautiful bird. Oh god, those are teeth. Okay. I've been a fan of Studio Ghibli, and more specifically the films of the incomparable Hayao Miyazaki, for most of my life. My first Miyazaki movie was a VHS copy of Princess Mononoke when I was in elementary school, followed shortly thereafter by a copy of Castle in the Sky, and they immediately grabbed hold of me and never let go. Princess Mononoke in particular is still one of the only films that makes me feel the same sense of wonder when I see it as an adult as I did watching it as a child. There is evil at work in the land to the west, Prince Ashitaka. In eighth grade, a friend showed me Spirited Away, and after eventually gaining access to the full Ghibli catalog with DVDs and streaming, the rest is history. At this point, I've seen almost every Miyazaki movie, including some of his more underrated titles like Porco Rosso or The Castle of Cagliostro. Yet, despite all the magic, darkness, and strangeness I've come to expect from his films, nothing could have prepared me for the truly bizarre spectacle that is The Boy and the Heron. On paper, it's a coming-of-age story about a young boy dealing with the loss of his mother. In execution, it's that, and also an unsettling romp through a fever dream of a fantasy world full of man-eating pelicans and parakeets with a deranged man heron as your guide. So today I want to take a look at Studio Ghibli's newest film, and allegedly Hayao Miyazaki's last, The Boy and the Heron, which was released in theaters July 14th, 2023 in Japan, and in the US on December 8th of the same year. This is the first Ghibli film that I have had the privilege to see in theaters, and to be sure, parts of it met my expectations with stunning animation, mysterious and ambiguous characters, and a serene, bucolic setting, but upon leaving the theater it also left me puzzled. After letting it marinate while learning a bit more about Miyazaki's life and seeing some different interpretations of what the film means, there are a few major themes that stuck out to me in The Boy and the Heron, especially with the added context of this initially being intended to be Miyazaki's last film. I say intended because the man is apparently already beating down the door of the animation studio with new project proposals as of September of 2023. He'll probably die at his desk with a drawing in front of him. But whether it's actually his last film or not, there's still a lot about The Boy and the Heron that feels like it's reflecting on Miyazaki's life and career and passing the torch to the next generation. It's a film that has a lot to say and chooses an artful and at times truly weird way to say it. A foundational element of much of Miyazaki's work is the exploration of explicitly anti-war themes through films that analyze the violence and horror of war and its impact on both humans and nature, as well as the weight of being complicit in that violence. To understand Miyazaki's anti-fascism and obsession with depicting the consequences of war, we have to understand a bit more about his childhood. Hayao Miyazaki was born January 5th, 1941 in Tokyo. He was forced to evacuate his home during a bombing at the age of three. Some of his earliest memories were of bombed-out cities. Growing up among the devastation of World War II and during an era of rapid change in Japan had a profound impact on Miyazaki's work. In Princess Mononoke, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, and Howl's Moving Castle, the destruction and violence of war is at the forefront, with graphic depictions of devastated landscapes and cities. In Porco Rosso and The Wind Rises, those elements are present to an extent as well but the focus is more on the guilt and moral consequences of participating in and surviving war. You can't believe that. You're a good person. No, the good guys were the ones who died. Both films are also explicitly critical of fascism and its enablers. Porco Rosso, delightfully so. Thanks for the offer, but I'd rather be a pig than a fascist. In The Boy and the Heron, the film begins with the tragic death of our young protagonist Mahito's mother, Hisako, in a hospital fire during an Allied air raid. Mahito witnesses the fire and desperately and futilely tries to get to her, in a heartbreaking and terrifying scene where we watch helplessly along with Mahito as the hospital is engulfed in flames. The animation captures the frantic fear and confusion, the very heat of the fire with devastating realism that expertly evokes the perspective of a frightened child. In the aftermath, much like Miyazaki's family, Mahito's family is forced to leave Tokyo due to the danger of ongoing attacks on major cities. His father, Shoichi, marries Natsuko, Mahito's mother's sister, and they evacuate to her rural family estate where Mahito's father has established a factory that manufactures parts for fighter planes. As a side note, I raised my eyebrows a bit at the idea of immediately marrying your dead spouse's sibling, but that was apparently common practice to preserve family financial ties in Japan during this era and has been practiced in other parts of the world as well for the same reason. Miyazaki's own mother was actually his father's second wife and married his father in a similar situation after the death of her sister. We also learn early on in the film that Natsuko is pregnant. And so, in rapid succession, the boy in the heron shows us the horrors of war and how it very directly upends Mahito's life. 
But we also see how his father is complicit in his mother's death as a war profiteer that builds aircrafts for the Imperial Army. Work that we see him actively take pride in as he brags about how much money he makes from it. Although it is worth noting that Miyazaki's mother was not killed during the war and lived into her 70s. With Mahito's father, the narrative explicitly seems to negatively frame this aspect of him, but we don't really see him reckon with his choices or experience explicit punishment for them in the story. His war profiteering is simply an unpleasant part of who he is that makes him a worse parent and husband as he has little time to devote to his family with the constant demands of the fascist machine. Like Mahito, Miyazaki was mostly insulated from much of the deprivation and struggles of daily life in Japan during and after the war, due to his family's wealth something he felt extremely guilty about even as a child. We see elements of this depicted in the eagerness of the maids, who Mahito affectionately calls the grannies, to see what food his father has brought to share with them, as well as lamenting shortages of commodities like tobacco, which the upper class still has access to but most do not. The first half of the film builds a strong foundation of daily life in fascist imperial Japan, from the active enablers like Mahito's father to the everyday ambivalence of people simply trying to survive. This theme is further explored in the second half of the film, after Mahito is transported into a surreal and fantastical world with many strange inhabitants, including an army of bloodthirsty parakeets and their king, which also serve as an allegorical criticism of fascism and how it ultimately cannot sustain life, resulting in destruction and corruption of anything it's allowed to take root in. Mahito's new home is in keeping with most of Miyazaki's movies, in that it's an idyllic rural place surrounded by greenery and wildlife. But the majesty and beauty we often associate with these settings is subdued by the weight of Mahito's grief and a sinister sense of wrongness, represented by a grey heron that taunts Mahito as it swoops around the property. The heron repeatedly tries to lure Mahito into a mysterious tower looming above the forest behind the house. The tower was built by Natsuko and Hisako's grand uncle, who disappeared inside and was never seen again. This knowledge, as well as the grannies worrying that Mahito might get taken, add to the sense that there's something sinister about the heron that keeps trying to get him into the tower. While Miyazaki's previous films like Nausicaa and Mononoke included themes of environmentalism, the need for harmony with nature, and nature's ambivalence to humanity's whims, in these films, even when it's terrifying, nature is beautiful, resplendent, awe-inspiring. The boy in the heron My takes a different approach, which we see primarily expressed through its use of birds. We do see other wildlife like frogs and fish, but the film seems to be fixated on birds in particular. Although the heron is beautiful when it wants to be, it's also a grotesque, windowsill-shitting supernatural creature with shifting human features and a gravelly voice. She's awaiting your rescue. In the English dub, it's a shockingly great debut voice acting performance by Robert Pattinson. You better hold on tight, spider monkey. <laughs> yes, that Robert Pattinson. This portrayal makes sense given the significance of the gray heron in Japanese folklore. According to National Geographic, in Japan, white herons are often depicted as messengers to the gods or as representing purity while grey herons tend to have darker, more sinister associations with the world of the spirits and death, to the extent many Japanese people actually find them unsettling. In this film, the titular heron is a grey heron. The heron is intimidating, as it constantly tries to provoke and lure Mahito. Save me, but as the film goes on, we see more of the heron's true form as Mahito and the heron develop a grudgingly cooperative relationship, after Mahito finally enters the tower when Natsuko vanishes and he goes in after her. He also drags one of the grannies, Kiriko, along with him. The story shares some themes with Spirited Away, such as a child exploring a supernatural world with a mysterious guide while searching for a parental figure who has disappeared there. But what exactly the heron is within the universe of the film is never as neatly explained as Kohaku in Spirited Away. You did it, Shihiro! I remember I was the spirit of the Kohaku River! We simply have to accept the heron at face, or faces, value. After Mahito arrives in the tower, the heron tries to attack him, but Mahito uses one of his feathers to control him after an arrow fletched with a stray feather chases the heron down. Mahito was inspired to make a bow and arrow after Natsuko defended him with one earlier in the film. The granduncle, depicted as a sort of celestial wizard, appears and instructs the heron to guide Mahito on his quest. You and I aren't friends or allies, kid. But the heron is reluctant until Mahito helps him plug the hole from the arrow so he can fly again. 
Another theme in much of Miyazaki's work that we see in The Boy and the Heron is the corruption of nature when we try to control it. In Mononoke and Nausicaa, this theme is examined with once peaceful creatures that become dangerous as humans invade and destroy their habitats. In The Boy and the Heron, we see this idea expressed through the pelicans, who were brought to this fantasy world by its creator and trapped there where they cannot eat the fish in the sea. And so they're forced to feed instead on Wada Wada, these little guys who seem to represent souls being reincarnated. Because is it really a Miyazaki movie if there aren't some little guys? A younger version of Kiriko rescues Mahito from the pelicans and explains the Wada Wada to him, as well as her work fishing for the dead who can't fish for themselves. Yes, I'm in love with Kiriko, why do you ask? With the knowledge that the Wada Wada are souls, the pelican's act of preying on them seems evil. But when Mahito confronts a pelican injured by someone defending the Wada Wada, he discovers they're actually just starving and doing what they have to to survive. This demonstrates the perversion of the granduncle taking the pelicans away from their natural environment for his purposes. It also mirrors the effect of fascism and war on a struggling population as systems beyond their control lead them to desperation. This contrasts with the enthusiastically fascist parakeets, who are also out of balance in this fantasy world, growing to unnatural sizes and developing a taste for human flesh, while blindly following as their king leads them down a path of destruction. At the end of the film, when Grand Uncle's world is destroyed, the parakeets and pelicans return to the real world and their natural inclinations, although the heron doesn't. As they fly away, the parakeets spray poop all over everyone. This is another little thing I found fascinating about this movie. We get two scenes with the parakeets pooing all over the place as they escape back into the real world. And there's also a scene where the heron drops a big old deuce on Mahito's windowsill. Mahito also references the bathroom twice, and one of the grannies offers him a bedpan, and he uses a small outhouse later in the movie. This is one of few references in the Ghibli universe I can think of to toilets or bathrooms or their necessity. The most prominent one I can remember up to this point was in Howl's Moving Castle, where Sophie reacts with disgust to Howl's toilet while cleaning the bathroom. One thing I didn't give much thought to until seeing The Boy and the Heron is that Miyazaki movies are some of the only ones I've seen that include birds and don't pretend bird poop doesn't exist. Birds poop a lot, and with little concern as to where, which anyone who spends time around them will attest to. I didn't notice until I went back and checked, but in Kiki's delivery service in Castle in the Sky, where there's birds, there's poop. However, The Boy and the Heron is certainly the first time animal droppings have taken center stage in quite this way. And including it is a deliberate choice since every moment in an animated production is meticulously planned. There are no accidents. I really wish I could find footage, but unfortunately, all I have to work with is the trailers that have been released so far. After giving it some thought, I think the poo is here to show nature in a way that isn't sanitized for human consumption, even for the purpose of making a film, but instead embraces the messy reality. The need to relieve waste is also something that unites us with other animals, which may be why mentions of the bathroom were included in the film as well. Although I will say, if they were going to have birds pooping all over the place, it should have been the pelicans. Pelicans poop so much, and it is so gross. On its surface, one of the more obvious themes of The Boy and the Heron is the inescapable nature of loss and the pain that goes along with it. We see this in the form of death, but also in the end of the way things were, even when change is necessary. We see this pain expressed in several scenes, including Mahito's nightmares, where his mother begs him to save her. Save me and also in the Heron's taunting insistence that she's still alive. Your mother, she's awaiting your rescue. But it goes deeper than that, to the extent that we see Mahito hurt himself because he has no outlet for his pain. Apparently Miyazaki was inspired to include this scene after learning about the prevalence of self-harm in children. And the scene is shocking and very effective. Throughout the movie, Natsuko does her best to fit into the role of a mother for Mahito, while still privately grieving the loss of her sister. Although he's polite to her, he's also very reserved, and his grief takes up too much space in his heart for him to really let her in right away. When Natsuko goes missing and he follows her into the tower to find her, this is our first sign that Mahito has begun reciprocating her affection. In the tower, Mahito is confronted directly by his grief, both by an illusion crafted by the heron and a young version of his mother, Himi. Himi is imbued with fire magic, which may be connected to her death. With Himi's help, Mahito fights his way to Natsuko's delivery room, as she's come to this world to have her baby. It's not explicitly explained why Natsuko goes to the tower, but I think it's because she doesn't want to face reality. 
And so she instinctively escapes to a place that's out of time, a place where her sister is alive among the spirits of the dead and reincarnated souls on their way to Earth. In the tower, she doesn't have to deal with the grief and turmoil of suddenly being expected to replace Hisako as a wife to her husband and mother to her son. After Mahito enters the delivery room, which is against the rules, he implores Natsuko to leave with him, and she tells him she hates him. When I initially watched this scene, I didn't entirely understand that, but an article in Forbes, you, I know, by Danny DiPlacido, suggested that it was actually Natsuko's concealed resentment for Mahito and her own pain that she had been bottling up, finally being released, which makes a lot of sense to me. During this scene is also the first time Mahito refers to Natsuko as mother, and this is the point in the movie where I cried, Although I do wish the movie had spent just a smidge more time developing their relationship so it had a bit more emotional punch, it's no feat to make me cry. I will cry at anything. The movie spends a lot of time on the slow progress of Mahito coming to terms with loss, but a lot less time building up the acceptance of Natsuko as a mother figure or on her emotional journey. But when Mahito accepts her, there is still a sense of bittersweet joy in moving forward despite the pain of letting go. During a scuffle in the delivery room, Mahito is knocked unconscious. In a dream, he meets Granduncle, the world's creator who wants him to become his successor. Granduncle explains how he made a deal with a fallen meteor to create his fantasy world. The meteor is actually a reference to a real one that crashed during the Meiji Restoration. Granduncle explains he must balance the blocks every three days or the world will fall apart. Mahito goes to Granduncle after he awakens, discovering that Himi has been stolen by the parakeets to use as a bargaining chip. After consideration, Mahito refuses because he recognizes his own flawed nature. The Parakeet King impatiently attempts to stack the blocks in Mahito's stead, but they fall, causing the world to crumble. As Mahito and Natsuko return to the real world, Himi and Kiriko return to their time, where Himi will eventually grow up to be Mahito's mother. There's a really sweet moment between them where they say goodbye. After they re-enter the real world, the elderly Kiriko reappears, having been protected as a doll in Mahito's pocket, and Mahito's memories of the other world begin to fade. His family eventually returns to Tokyo. The Boy and the Heron also references the Buddhist philosophy of reincarnation, with cycles of life, death, and rebirth, as well as the philosophy of attachment and separation, which is seen as a fundamental root of suffering in Buddhism. The presence of both spirits and reincarnated souls journeying back to Earth further establishes the connection between the fantastical world of the Boy and the Heron and Buddhist philosophy. Miyazaki doesn't identify as a religious person from what I've read, but has great respect for some elements of Buddhism and Shintoism, and has incorporated references to and elements of both into prior films. Here, the tower existing out of time calls into question whether time is linear, or whether all moments exist simultaneously. I am not gone. Our moments fall around us like rain. <laughs> this may be a reference to the philosophy of Theravada Buddhism, in which time is viewed as cyclical, without beginning or end. This may be why we see characters like Himi and Kiriko at different points in their lives, in Grand Uncle's world. At the end of The Boy and the Heron, Mahito accepting the inevitability of separation, but still being brave enough to continue seeking attachments, is a powerful culmination of his story. Mahito's family has also been reborn, in a way, with the addition of Natsuko and Mahito's younger sibling. The family returning to Tokyo may also represent the symbolic death of Imperial Japan and the country's rebirth in the post-war era. Because of who I am as a person, I looked up the translation to the inscription above the doorway in the tower. Facemi la Divina Potestate. It's a quote from Dante's Inferno. The English translation is Divine Power Created Me. In a discussion on Reddit, someone posted the stanza the line is from, and I think it resonates beautifully with Mahito's journey. Through me the way into the grieving city. Through me the way into eternal sorrow. Through me the way among the lost people. Justice moved my high creator. Divine power created me. Highest wisdom and the primal love. Before me were no things created, except eternal ones, and I endure eternal. Abandon all hope, ye who enter. Beyond the exploration of grief, pain, and change, another theme that seems to present itself in The Boy and the Heron is a meditation on the nature of creating fictional worlds, films in Miyazaki's case. There are numerous interpretations of what Mahito and the Grand Uncle could represent, and each may mean multiple or different things to you depending on your perspective. My friend MJ had some wonderful analysis on this aspect of the film that she has allowed me to include in this video. The Boy and the Heron draws very heavily off of the life of Hayao Miyazaki, who is represented in both the main character of young Mahito, and an aging wizard who is desperately seeking a successor to the kingdom of worlds he has spent years creating. More than any other Ghibli film, 
This movie feels like a sort of love letter from Miyazaki to us, a sentiment that was driven home towards the end of the movie when the wizard urges Mahito to create a world better than the war-torn one he was born into, a world he chooses to accept and return to and make brighter, a feat that Miyazaki himself accomplished with the advent of Studio Ghibli and the endless joy his films have spread across the world. I will simply add that this film has been viewed by many, including Miyazaki himself, as his most autobiographical film, with Miyazaki referring to the film as my story to other Ghibli staff members. There's a tenderness with which this movie approaches Mahito that feels like an expression of Miyazaki's affection and kindness towards his younger self looking back, a sort of delayed self-acceptance. It's probably not a coincidence that he offers him 12 building blocks, which may represent the feature films Miyazaki has directed. Mahito may also represent the next generation of animators, who will create fictional worlds of their own. I think this interpretation also speaks to the nature of The Boy and the Heron as Miyazaki's most collaborative film, featuring a massive team of veteran animators he worked closely with, especially when we consider the reputation Miyazaki has for being reluctant to relinquish control. The film also serves as a reminder of the imperfect ability of filmmaking to create an alternative to our flawed and messy world, or to capture it in all of its beauty and ugliness. Toshio Suzuki, a longtime colleague of Miyazaki, has a slightly different interpretation of the film. Viewing the Grand Uncle instead as the deceased legendary animator Iseo Takahata, a longtime friend of Miyazaki's. This is a fascinating explanation for the character, especially since Mahito declines to follow in the Grand Uncle's footsteps. Miyazaki has been shown to be very staunch in his determination not to imitate other creators. For example, he destroyed much of his early manga work when the resemblance of his style to that of another artist was pointed out to him. So, in a way, he did refuse to follow in Takahata's footsteps, instead forging his own path. Some have also interpreted the heron to represent Toshio Suzuki, whom Miyazaki was initially suspicious of, but eventually developed a friendship and strong working relationship with. In Japan, the title of The Boy and the Heron is How Do You Live? The movie is very loosely inspired by a novel of the same name from Miyazaki's childhood, the same one Mahito's mother left him in the movie. The 1937 novel by Genzaburo Yoshino is a short coming-of-age story that also serves as a sort of guide to children for living an ethical life. I read the English translation of How Do You Live for this video, and found it to be beautiful and moving despite its low stakes and slow pace. It's a sweet, meandering slice-of-life story about a young boy without a father, learning life lessons as he becomes more conscious of himself, the society around him, and the kind of person he wants to be. Interwoven throughout the narrative are conversations with his uncle, who serves as a surrogate father. We also see entries from the uncle's notebook, which he's been using as a sort of diary to collect all of the life advice he wants to give his nephew when he's older. The novel features discussions of everything from molecules and gravity... Gravity to the relationship between consumption and production, assumptions of poverty and wealth, the importance of friendship and apologies, and of course, staying true to oneself. There's even an extended section on heroism and Napoleon. It includes a lot of different ideas and how they relate to becoming a good person and living a good life. The part of the novel that resonated the most with me and felt like it had the most overlap with the themes in the film came towards the end of the novel when the main character, Junichi, is disappointed in himself for letting down his friend after promising to stick up for him against some older classmates who had it out for him. When the older boys confront his friend, in the moment, Junichi panics and lets fear get the better of him. His friends are hurt and he escapes unscathed. Junichi agonizes over his failure to stick up for his friend the way his other friends did, the way he knew in the moment he should have. Afterwards, Junichi's mother recounts an experience she had climbing a long staircase to a shrine behind an elderly woman with a heavy bag. The entire walk up, she intended to offer help to the old woman whenever the opportunity arose, but each time she hesitated, and eventually they both made it to the top of the stairs and the opportunity to do the kind thing had passed. She tells him, Once we had gotten to the top of the stairs, my good intentions didn't matter at all. The chance to do what I felt in my heart probably wasn't going to come a second time. That opportunity was gone forever the moment that woman reached the top step, wasn't it? Without the memory of those stone steps, I wouldn't have been able to encourage the good and beautiful things in my own heart to grow and become what they are now. If I didn't have that memory, I might not have realized for a long time after how each and every event in our lives happens once only and will never be repeated. How we have to work to nurture what is good and beautiful in our own hearts. So I think that what happened on those stone steps was not a loss. I was sorry, but I also learned something essential about how to live. The Boy and the Heron is a very different story. And to be fair, it doesn't claim to adapt How Do You Live, merely to have borrowed its title. 
That both stories are about a young boy learning his place in the world after the death of a parent is where the narrative similarities end. However, the themes of impermanence, regret, and the idea that moments of pain and disappointment can be pivotal moments that propel us forward are present in both stories. In The Boy and the Heron, Mahito learns how to let the grief of losing his mother live alongside the love he feels for his new family, and decides who he wants to be when he refuses the granduncle's offer to live in a world of his own making instead of the real world. Some Ghibli Matrix vibes. The granduncle's retreat into the fantastical worlds inside the tower demonstrates his refusal to face the pain and harsh realities of the real world, but also to embrace its beauty and all its flaws. Part of the beauty of The Boy and the Heron is how many different meanings can be gleaned from it. When Miyazaki was asked in an interview what the answer to the question, how do you live, was, he replied, I am making this movie because I do not have the answer. Despite its bizarre elements, The Boy and the Heron features many of Studio Ghibli's mainstays, a bright child protagonist, seemingly villainous characters who are more complex than initially let on, and gorgeously rendered animation, all accompanied by a beautiful score by Joe Hisaishi. <laughs> Another fun tidbit I learned while researching this video is that Miyazaki actually demonstrated his total trust in his longtime collaborator by letting him watch the first visual cut of the film and allowing him to create the score with very little supervision or oversight, simply saying, I know you will make something great. The resulting score is truly superb, surprising no one. While I would consider many of Miyazaki's works to be masterpieces, this film feels like his magnum opus. There is a stunning depth and variety of interpretations to the meaning of the film that people will likely be analyzing for decades to come. Like everyone else, except for perhaps some contemporaries trapped in his shadow, I hope Miyazaki goes on making movies for as long as he's able, but regardless, I'll always be grateful for the gift that is this beautiful film that asks us to consider, how do you live? But that's just my opinion. Let me know what you thought of The Boy and the Heron in the comments down below. Did you find this movie as bizarre as I did? What themes stood out to you? I'll be revisiting this movie and Miyazaki's other films in future videos, so like, share, and subscribe for more. See you next time, Peter Zane. Also, I just want to say a quick thank you to my partner Riley for helping edit the script for this video. You're the best!